stuff like, I'll contact the orphanages on Bay Tour to let them know we might be sending them a new guest. Oh, good idea. Let's turn them over to an orphanage on the planet that's still recovering from decades of brutal colonialism and genocide instead of allowing them to grow up in the limitless prosperity of our utopian paradise in the Federation. Cool, I'll get right on it. Cisco and Dax leave the infirmary, and as they're walking through the promenade, Cisco laments how much he misses Jake being a small child. There are times when I'd give almost anything to go back to the days when I could make Jake happy just by lifting him over my head. Yeah. And also Captain Picard hadn't killed his wife yet. Yeah. Well, it's not as if Jake hates you nowadays. True. In fact, since I'm so full of friendly, fatherly feelings, I'm gonna go straight home and give Jake a hug. So Cisco goes home and goes up to Jake and says, Give your old man a hug. And Jake turns away like, No, I hate you. What did I do? You invited my girlfriend over for dinner without telling me. I told you a few weeks ago that if you didn't invite her over, I would invite her myself. So you see, this is really all your fault. But if it's that much of a problem, I can call her and cancel. It's not a problem. It's not a massive, all-consuming problem that's been on my mind every second since I found out. It's good. It's fine. I'm fine. Great. Cisco heads back to the infirmary where Bashir has an update on the baby. He ain't no baby. The kid's had a bit of a growth spurt, and he is now the equivalent of like a nine-year-old human. Bashir is still puzzled by his rapid growth and suspects the child is the product of some pretty advanced genetic engineering. This suspicion is bolstered when the child just up and starts talking. The child doesn't have a name and doesn't know about specific things like, for example, space stations, but he can communicate his needs and desires. He's hungry and he wants to learn. Bashir speculates that his genetic engineering must have included a certain level of basic intelligence loaded into his brain because he's rapidly developing verbal skills without anyone ever teaching him. Dropping by the cargo bay, Cisco says to O'Brien, are you finished examining Quark's junk? And O'Brien says, not yet. We're giving every inch of Quark's junk a thorough going over. But we have found a few things. This waffle iron where the baby was found was keeping him in a state of suspended animation, almost as if the people transporting him didn't want him to start maturing until they reached their destination. Cisco is like, good work. Oh, by the way, can you fix the replicator in my quarters? I'm having Jake's girlfriend over for dinner tonight, and I'm going to break them up because she's an older woman and a Dobho girl. I think you mean Dobho? Is that what I said? Anyway, I do not approve, and I figure the best way to handle the situation is to humiliate them at dinner in front of each other. You do you, boss. I'll send someone in to fix the replicator for you. Thanks, Chief. In the meantime, keep exploring Quark's junk. Here it drops by Odo's new quarters. Odo finally got quarters instead of just sleeping in a bucket in the back of his office. Good for him. And she's brought a housewarming gift, a mostly dead plant. Odo's like, oh, hey, great, thanks. Kira hits around and she wants to see Odo's new place, so he reluctantly lets her in and shows her around. He's furnished the place with a bunch of sculptures and other exotic-looking objects, including a big playground climbing dome that I would totally have in my house if I had the space. He tells Kira that he wants to practice taking the shapes of these different objects to experience what it really means to be a shapeshifter. Kira's like, that's awesome, dude, good for you. Where are you going to put the small burden I have gifted to you? And Odo says, ah, I have an idea. And he pulls out his bucket. Quark's been sneaking in while I'm at work and using it for a toilet, but now I can use it for a planter. I'm sure that will discourage him. Meanwhile, Bashir is sharing a meal and chatting with Dax when he gets an urgent summons to the infirmary. The orphan from the Waffle Maker is still growing, and he's ready to leave, thanks. He escapes the infirmary and runs loose on the promenade, knocking people over along the way. Odo shows up and stops him in his tracks. We get our first good look at the more mature Waffle Iron Kid and realize what species he belongs to. He's a gem hadar. Naturally, as soon as they hear about this, Starfleet orders Cisco to send the Waffle Iron Kid to a starbase so they can interview him and study him and maybe some light vivisection. Who knows? Bashir objects on humanitarian grounds, and so does Odo, who tells Cisco, I know what it's like to be treated like a laboratory specimen. Don't turn this kid over to Starfleet yet. Give me a chance to talk to him, to reach him, to see if he can be more than the killing machine the founders made him to be. I'm a changeling. He's genetically perfect.
programmed to listen to me. I know I can control it. Cisco agrees to buy Odo some time with Starfleet, and Odo goes to security, where the Waffle Iron Kid is being held in a cell. He feels sick, which Bashir says is because his body lacks a necessary enzyme, and without it, he's experiencing symptoms analogous to a drug addict. Going through withdrawal, he needs to run some more tests, but the kid isn't cooperating. So Odo says to the kid, "Cooperate." And the kid's like, "Okay." Odo's like, "This is gonna be so easy. It's time for the big dinner at the Cisco place." Ben serves up some delicious-looking shrimp creole, and he's all set to start the compulsory breakup process when he makes the rookie mistake of asking Marta about herself. So she tells him that her parents were killed during the occupation. She's been on her own since she was 13. She has a sister and a brother, but they don't speak because her siblings don't approve of her working as a Dabo girl. Isn't it sad how judgmental people are about Dabo girls? It's so nice to be sharing a meal in an enlightened Federation household where no one could possibly harbor such small-minded opinions. <laughs> Jake says, "You know, Marta's not just a Dabo girl. She's also..." A writer and a good one. Bart is like, come on, I'm not that good. But Jake's like, yes, you are. In my opinion, as a 16-year-old who wants to have sex with you, your writing is amazing. Bart counters that her writing isn't as good as the poetry Jake writes. And Cisco is like, you write poetry? Bart says, yeah, and he plays Dob Jock. And Cisco is like, play Dob Jock? Bart says, yeah, and he plays Dob Jock too, but he's not nearly as good at that. He actually owes Quark a lot of money, and if he doesn't pay up soon. I'm supposed to drop the pretense of being his girlfriend and cut off one of his fingers. And Cisco is like, "You play Dabo?" Meanwhile, O'Brien has discovered something under Quark's junk, and he wants to show it to Odo. It's a drug dispenser, and it might be the drug that the Waffle Iron Kid is jonesing for. O'Brien's like, "Creating a child that will be born addicted to a chemical. I don't understand. It. How did the mother of this child allow him to end up here?" And Odo's like, "Well, maybe she put the kid away." And she's gone to get a hit of Petrocell White. Nailed it. It works after all. I feel vindicated. Okay, they don't know it's called Petrocell White yet, but close enough. You can stretch a little too, you know. So I can put deal young jokes in my Star Trek reviews. Once the kid gets his fix, he's ready for action. He invites himself over to Odo's place, and while there, Odo takes the opportunity to try and break through some of the genetically implanted Jem Hadar conditioning. The kid asks why Odo wants to look like a humanoid when he's a changeling and is therefore superior to them. Odo says, "I'm not superior to them, or to you, or to anyone. Everyone is equal." The kid's like, that sounds like liberal worship, but the fascists who created me programmed me to always defer to changelings like you. So I'm not really sure what to do here. Odo says, what do you want to do? And the kid says, I want to learn about my people. So Odo shows him a security video of some Jem'Hadar soldiers fighting the Starfleet crew on the Defiant. Odo says, as you can see, your people are brutal warriors, but that doesn't mean you have to be like that. Together we can find. Healthier ways for you to channel your instinctive feelings of aggression. They go to the hollow suite, and Odo says, "Computer, run program Odo one." And this alien dude appears, and Odo says, "Here, you can fight with this guy until you tire yourself out. But remember, you can only fight holograms. No fighting with real people outside this room, okay?" While the kid is having fun fighting the holographic alien, Kira walks in. Odo is like, "Hey, you can't just walk in on someone's hollow suite program. Good thing I was." Running Odo one and not Odo number two. Kira pulls Odo outside and says, "Hey, maybe encouraging the genetically engineered murder machine to indulge his murder urge isn't the best idea. Also, he moved in with you. Sure, you realize that he only listens to you because he was programmed that way. You'll only be able to stop him from going full Jem Hadar for so long. He was designed to kill, and sooner or later, holograms aren't going to be enough." And That's what he's going to do. Odo says, "I was supposed to be a founder. You used to be a terrorist. We've chosen to move beyond our old programming. So why shouldn't he get the same chance? It's easy for you to say that you are the only person on this station he won't 
killed. Odo gets called to Cisco's office, and Cisco informs him that Starfleet is tired of waiting, so they're sending a ship to pick up the Wobble Iron Kid and take him to a star base. Odo is pissed, and so is the kid, who reveals that he's been hiding in the office this whole time using that personal cloak gimmick that Jem Hadar can do. He pulls a gun on Cisco and says, I'm not going on any starship. I'm leaving and I'm taking Odo with me. Now give me a runabout. A runabout is a kind of starship. Shut up! You know what I mean. Odo convinces Cisco to let them go. And on their way to the runabout, Odo tries to persuade the kid to choose the third option. Don't go with Starfleet. Don't go to join the rest of the Jem Hadar, which is what the kid wants. Take the runabout to another planet somewhere in unexplored space where the two of them can live and the kid can become who he wants to be, not who he was programmed to be. But the kid says, who I was programmed to be is who I want to be. And I don't know what the other changelings are like, but I know they aren't like you. You don't belong here any more than I do because people have changed you, filled your mind with silly false ideas and beliefs. It's pathetic. And I know because the infallible God beings who created me wrote that in my brain. Cisco and some security goons block their way to the runabout, but Odo tells Cisco to let them go. I'll drop him off in Dominion territory, then come back, Odo says. It's the only safe option. Cisco reluctantly agrees, and Odo and the Waffle Iron Kid leave to board the runabout. Later, once everything has settled down, Cisco is talking station business with O'Brien, and they see Jake and Marta walking down the promenade together. O'Brien's like, I thought you were going to break them up, and Cisco says, I was, but then I got to know her a little better, which led to me getting to know Jake a little better, which led to me playing Dom Jot with Jake and losing, like... So much money. Well, at least he'll be able to pay off for it now. Kira's sitting at a table and Odo walks up and says, So, about the Waffle Iron Kid just being a killing machine who will never be able to transcend his programming. You were right. I'm sorry. I know. It's just that I was so certain I could... No, no, I meant, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Did you repeat that? The kid wasn't able to overcome his... No, no. After that. You were right. I'm sorry? The end! Oh, boy, what a heartwarming episode, huh? Just so optimistic and life-affirming and... Yeah, I like this episode. Well, better to say I liked parts of this episode very much, and I admire the way the writers of this episode chose to structure it, which is atypical in some ways. I'm not sure it will hang together, which... There are certain flaws. Before I get to the flaws, though, let me talk about the middle parts. I really like the Cisco, Jake, Marta plot. Yes, it's basic. Yes, it's sitcom y, especially in the dinner scene. Yes, it's fairly predictable, but it gives Ben Cisco the sort of character arc that we, the protagonists of Star Trek shows, almost never get. The main character is usually in the right, more than speaking, from the beginning of the story, and their arc throughout the episode involves things other than them being compelled to reevaluate their moral position or something. But in the abandoned, Cisco starts out in the wrong. He doesn't like Marta. He doesn't approve of Jake's relationship with her, and he is determined to break them up. That is his proper course of action as Jake's father. And granted, some of Cisco's concerns seem at least reasonable. Jake is only 16, and Marta is 20. A four-year age gap at those ages would at least warrant some scrutiny. 